The following is a recording of Greenville Presbyterian Theological Seminary. For more information, visit gpts.edu. Fathers and brothers, if you have your Bibles, I invite you to open them and turn with me to John chapter 11. John chapter 11, we'll be looking at verses 17 to 27 this morning. I want to say a word of thanks to the seminary for giving me this truly uh, wonderful honor and privilege of bringing the Word of God this morning. We'll be looking at John chapter 11 beginning in the 17th verse. Give your attention now to the reading of God's holy, inerrant, and life-giving Word. Now when Jesus came, he found that Lazarus had already been in the tomb four days. Bethany was near Jerusalem, about two miles off, and many of the Jews had come to Martha and Mary to console them concerning their brother. So when Martha heard that Jesus was coming, she went out and met him. But Mary remained seated in the house. Martha said to Jesus, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. But even now, I know that whatever you ask from God, God will give to you. Jesus said to her, your brother will rise again. Martha said to him, I know that he will rise again in the resurrection on the last day. Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. Whoever believes in me, though he die, yet shall he live. And everyone who lives and believes in me shall never die. Do you believe this? And she said to him, Yes, Lord, I believe that you are the Christ, the Son of God, who is coming into the world. The grass withers, the flower falls, but the word of our God abides forever. Please join me in a word of prayer. We rejoice, O Father, that you have revealed to us that the Holy Spirit has from all eternity proceeded from both you and the Son. And so now we ask, O our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, that you and the Father would send unto us the Holy Spirit so that as he is the bond of love between you and the Father, so he would bind our hearts more into that wonderful, glorious fellowship with our triune God that is the highest joy of all mankind as your word is preached this morning. We ask these things in Christ's name and for his sake. Amen. Amen. Please be seated. Back in the early 1920s, in an area of this country known as Appalachia, a preacher developed a portion of his sermon called Dialogue with Death that was later taken out and became part of folk singing in that region of the country, made famous by Ralph Stanley's rendition of it, O oh Death, in the movie O oh Brother, Where Art Thou? I know we have a number of international students. Appalachia might not mean much to you. It's a mountainous region of our country. Uh, it happens to be the region that our own Zach Dodson hails from. And so you can understand when I say it's a region known for its colorful and interesting people. <laughs> They're a fun group of people, but they also have a very uh, spiritual and introspective side of them from which this ode comes to. The setting is a young man with his mother dying early on in life. And as the scene unfolds, death enters in and addresses this poor young man. Well, what is this that I can't see with ice-cold hands taking hold of me? Well, I am death. None can excel. I'll open the door to heaven or hell. The children's prayed. The preachers preached. Time and mercy is out of your reach. I'll fix your feet till you can't walk. I'll lock your jaw till you can't talk. I'll close your eyes so you can't see this very hour now. Come and go with me. For I am death. I am come to take the soul, leave the body and leave it cold to draw the flesh up off the frame. Dirt and worm will both have their claim. And as this young man sees death approaching, he begins to plead with him, won't you spare me over till another year? Oh, death, how you're treating me. You've closed my eyes so I can't see. You're hurting my body. You make me cold. You're running my life right out of my soul. Oh, death, please consider my age. Don't take me at this stage. My wealth is all at your command. If you will but remove your icy hand. 
But as in the song, so as in life, death gets the final word. The old, the young, the rich or poor, all alike me you know. No wealth, no land, no silver or gold, nothing satisfies me but your soul. I think that song touches a chord in most every human who hears it and can understand what's being said. I think the artist has powerfully captured several truths that are true about death and from our earliest understandings of it begin to plague our mind and our peace about this life. It touches on the fact that death is no respecter of persons. I have conducted a funeral for a man who was close, if not over 300 pounds, and his casket was accordingly. One time, though, when I was conducting a funeral, I walked into the wrong room and saw a casket that had to be no longer than one foot because an infant had died eight months tragically due to disease. Death is something that whether you're like my 96-year-old grandmother who died with her family uh, around her bed peacefully dying in the Lord, it will come to you then, or perhaps like my young friend Daniel, you might meet your age, uh, your death tragically at the age of 17 in a car wreck. But death comes for everyone, regardless of your standing, regardless of your social status. Death is also a universal truth. The old preacher Samuel Davies once said that death has so stalked our mortal race these 6,000 years that this earth is virtually one large graveyard strewn with the bodies of our ancestors. Came across this tomb one time and it didn't have the normal platitudes that are found on tombstones. There was simply a name, some dates, and this inscription. As you are now, so once was I. As I am now, so you soon shall be. Prepare for death and come follow me. Every time we conduct a funeral, particularly as ministers of the gospel, every time we go to a funeral, when we look into a casket, we are looking into a mirror. And it's in the face of this reality of death, its universality, that it's not a respecter of persons, that perhaps the best and most blessed words that have ever been spoken to man are found in this passage when Jesus says, I am the resurrection and the life. These words are important, not just because of our existential moment or time in which we live, but I think it's exegetically the case that these are some of the most important words Jesus ever spoke. If you look at John's gospel, it is to use that phrase from Sinclair Ferguson as though God struck it with his own golden hammer. It divides neatly into the book of the signs in chapters 1 through 12 where there's seven miracles and each one of them has a teaching attached to it and then the uh, chapters 13 to the end are the conclusion after the public ministry of Jesus of his death and resurrection. This is the last miracle that John records in the book of John. And I think as many commentators say, it's as if John feels that this is the apex of the ministry of Jesus, that if he can bring us relief from death, he is a full, complete, and total Savior who will save us completely from our sins and from its effects. As we look at the teaching of Jesus this morning, uh, I want to show you how important what Jesus teaches us about death is important for us both for our personal and pastoral piety how what Jesus teaches us should be important for us in our personal relationship with the Lord Jesus, but also as ministers or future ministers of the gospel, what he says should be at the core of our identity and message. As we look at this passage, we won't be able to look at everything that's involved here, but there are two things I'd like us to focus on. First, Martha's faith, and second, Jesus' teaching. Now, as we look at Martha's faith, we need to know something about the context. Jesus has been made aware that his friend Lazarus is dying, but he tells his disciples, I'm going to hold off. I am not going to go there, and he waits for Lazarus to die. He waits for him to die so much so that we're told in verse 17, now when Jesus came, he found that Lazarus had already been in the tomb for four days. Martha and Mary had sent word to Jesus, but he purposefully delayed. And you see Martha and Mary continuing in some sense. There are patterns that you see throughout the Gospels. Mary is more quiet, hearing that Jesus is coming, remaining in the home. But Martha, being more vigorous and aggressive, goes out to meet Jesus. 
And look at what she says in verse 21 and following. Martha said to Jesus, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. But even now I know that whatever you ask from God, he will give to you. Here we find words that the commentators are divided over. Some say that, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died, is accusatory in tone. And it's hard to take it in any way other than that. This is a real story with people who are grieving and in pain. And for Martha to run up to Jesus and tell him, if you had been here, my brother wouldn't have had to die, certainly had uh, a sense of, of misunderstanding, a sense of saying, I don't understand why you aren't here. I know even that you're here now, God will do what you ask. But if you had been here in the first place when I sent for you, my brother wouldn't have died. Matthew Henry and some others say that this is a sign of unbelief on Martha's part, but uh, I have a hard time believing that what she's saying here is inappropriate. It's a very logical thing for any human being. If you know Jesus has the power to raise from the dead and he could have prevented this, if you know he can stop sickness, it's very logical to ask, well, Jesus, you love my brother. Why weren't you here? Moreover, what Martha says here is fairly mild in comparison to some of the things that are said throughout the rest of the scripture when God's people are in pain and they don't understand what's going on. This is fairly tame when compared to the words of Habakkuk, who you can feel the pathos and energy in what he says in that first chapter when he says, Lord, your people are so evil and hideous and wicked that my eyes are filled with bloodshed all the day and you do what? You stand there and watch this. How can you allow this to go on? So I don't think we can accuse Martha of doing anything inappropriate here. And we can see moreover as we go through this, Jesus does not rebuke her, but he deals with her kindly and compassionately, taking her honest assertion and her questions on face value as coming from a position of faith. I think seeing and understanding how Jesus deals with Martha here is very important because one of the things that you're going to have to do in pastoral ministry particularly when people are in a situation where they're dealing with death or they're dealing with a situation that's so bad they feel like death would be a release to them, is they are wrestling with God's heavy hand of providence upon them. And when they start asking questions and they start bringing those questions to you and they start asking you to help them in their lives, how are you going to know when a parishioner is just suffering or when a parishioner is in unbelief beginning to defy the Almighty God. That's where I think this text has an important lesson to tell us, and that is this, that questions, even very pointed ones, that come from a position of belief, God never casts away. It's clear that Martha is only saying, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died, because she believes who Jesus is. Look at verse 22. But even now, I know whatever you ask from God, God will give to you. That is not a statement of disbelief in the power of Jesus. Look down a little bit more at verse 24. Martha said to him, I know that he will rise again in the resurrection in the last day. Again, a statement of belief in the truth of Scripture. And in verse 27, in response to Jesus' question, do you believe what I've just said? She gives a confession that has to be second only to the confession of Peter in Matthew 16. She said to him, yes, Lord, I believe that you are the Christ, the Son of God, who is coming into the world. And you need to develop a sensitivity to people and try as best as you can to figure out when they're questioning, when their assertion, when their hard things that they have to say to the Lord are coming from a position of, of a lack of knowledge but true faith and when it's coming from a heart of unbelief. I'll never forget very early on, in fact it began shortly before I was ordained, there was a, a woman under our care who went through a very traumatic situation. Her son died very tragically towards the end of high school. And he died with no confession of faith in the Lord Jesus. And if you knew how this man was living, you would not assume that there's any grounds for thinking that he was a Christian. 
And this woman was a, a faithful believer in the Lord Jesus and she wrestled with this. And as I tried to help her and counsel her, she gave me some of the most difficult questions that I think I have ever heard in my life. She said, Scott, you expect me to believe as a scripture says that God loves me. How can God love me and yet damn my son? Scott, I have enemies in this world that I genuinely do not like them and on the worst days I might wish them harm. I would never in a hundred years want harm to come upon their children. But being a Calvinist, I know that my son's eternal destiny lay in the hands of God and I'm to believe that God loves me when he treats me worse than I would treat my own enemies. Those are questions that I have no good answer for. I don't think there are good answers if you truly understand the problem of evil and the mystery of God's sovereignty. We, we can't understand or answer those sorts of questions. But that woman is still in the faith. She still believes. Those were questions not coming from someone who hated God, but someone who loved God but couldn't understand what God was doing in her life. We had another woman that we were trying to help at that time whose marriage was falling apart far, far less levels of tragedy than that other woman. And she said, I don't understand how God could give me uh, the sort of husband that he did. This is not fair. This is not right. And it turned out that she was having an affair on her husband and she was later excommunicated. You look at those two sets of questions and you realize that they come from different places. And if people under your charge and care have genuine questions that flow from their faith in the Lord Jesus, those are not questions that the Lord casts out. And notice too, I think second from this, we should draw that God allows us to be honest and direct in our dealings with him when we are going through suffering and pain. Again, the Lord Jesus does not rebuke Martha. The Lord Jesus uh, does not rebuke anyone who sincerely asks him, what are you doing? I don't understand the ways of God. Uh, the Lord did not rebuke Habakkuk. The Lord did not rebuke the psalmist when in Psalm 88 the conclusion is, and darkness has become my only friend. When we have difficult times and seasons in our life, the Lord, I think, invites us to pour out our hearts genuinely to him. I mean, after all, none of us in here know the heart, but God alone knows the heart. So why should we try to hide our legitimate questions, our legitimate difficulties, our legitimate sufferings? Who are you kidding? You can't hide it from God anyway, and there is no better place than in prayer to pour out your misunderstandings or your lack of understanding about the world and God's ways than to God himself at the throne of his grace. This is important for each and every one of us in this room as we will, if we have not already, go through times of suffering and difficulty, but I think particularly preparing for the ministry. I remember when I got ordained, my pastor, Rick Phillips, looked at me in the middle of the sermon. He said, Scott, I'm genuinely happy for you, but in a real sense, I'm sorrowful for you because now that you're coming into the ministry, your sorrows are going to increase as you bear the burdens of God's people. You'll walk with people at their most difficult times. And when you have a counseling case that you've poured hours and hours into and people decide to do the unbiblical thing and walk away, when someone calls you and tells you their children have been abused, there are situations where you are going to wrestle with what God is doing even as a minister. And you need to be able to have the same sort of confidence that Martha did to walk into the Lord's presence, say honestly what you're thinking, but do so from a position of reverence, respect, and faith. And the good news is that the Lord Jesus will always respect that sort of prayer. And in response to Martha's faith and her lack of understanding, Jesus then gives her teaching that is so critical for us to understand, particularly as men who are training for the ministry. Jesus says in verse 25, I am the resurrection and the life. Whoever believes in me, though he die, yet shall he live. And everyone who lives and believes in me shall never die. Do you believe this? And she said to him, yes, Lord, I believe that you are the Christ, the Son of God, who is coming into the world. These three lines of thought, I am the resurrection and the life. Whoever believes in me, though he die, yet he shall live. And everyone who lives and believes in me shall never die. 
These are three truths that can be somewhat difficult to translate, difficult to interpret, because on the surface of it, it can look like Jesus is saying, if you believe in me, you will in some sense never die. And we know that's true in some sense, but the context here is physical death. Uh, this is happening in the context of a funeral. And so how should we take each of these three statements? There are different ways to do this, but I think this is the best way to take each of them. First, Jesus is telling us that resurrection life comes to us only by union with him. In other words, the blessings of resurrection life do not come to us apart from union with Christ by faith. Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. Jesus here is pointing to himself as the one who is the source, the one who is the archetype, the one who is the pattern, the one who is the fountain of the resurrection life that each and every one of us needs in order to overcome death in this world. I think the Apostle Paul in, in uh, 1 Corinthians 15 is picking up on what Jesus says here when he says that Jesus is the first fruits of the resurrection. And as Voss points out, that concept of first fruits is a precious and important thing for us. In an agrarian society, the first fruits were important because it would tell you what the rest of the crop is likely to look like because there was an organic connection between the first fruit that came off of the tree and the last fruit that would come off of that tree. And here Jesus says, I am the resurrection and the life. I am the one who through my life and my death will become the source of resurrection that will overcome death. John Calvin's words in the beginning of book three of the Institutes could not be more correct in channeling Jesus' logic that so long as Jesus remains outside of us, we are wholly estranged from all of his benefits. Christ only gives us his benefits as we are united to him. But Jesus tells us not only that he's the source of our resurrection, but that whoever believes in him will be raised after their death. I'm the resurrection and the life. Whoever believes in me, though he die, yet shall he live. I don't think Jesus is talking about spiritual resurrection here. I don't think regeneration is in, in view here where uh, though we're dead spiritually, we're made alive in Christ. That certainly is true and that metaphor could apply. But I think in the context of physical death that so pervades this, Jesus is saying, whoever believes in me, though he physically die, he will be raised again. This is why in the funeral rites, we most commonly, as we are doing the graveside, walk to the head of the casket, placed our hands upon it, and say, earth to earth, ashes to ashes, dust to dust, we now commit the body of brother or sister so-and-so to the ground in the sure and certain hope of the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Jesus says, though you will die, I will raise you. And third and finally, Jesus promises us eternal and never-ending life. Whoever believes in me, though he die, yet shall he live. And everyone who lives and believes in me shall never die. What is Jesus talking about? It sounds like he's saying, if you believe in me before you die, you will never die. Well, we have 2,000 years of church history that proves that interpretation is patently false. You can't even talk about martyrs in this context with that making any sense. I think the, a literal reading of this text is more helpful. If you look at it, there's two words that tend not to be translated in English or tend to be uh, sublimated into the translation. Everyone who lives and believes in me shall never die. There's a phrase, ace ion, or unto the age in here that some translations pick up on saying you will never die forever or you will never die ever as an emphatic. But I think if you translate it literally, it's everyone who lives and believes in me shall never die forever. And I think that's a hint that what Jesus has in mind here is eternal life. After the resurrection from the dead, you will no longer die. You will no longer be subject to death. He's about to raise Lazarus from the dead. But the problem with Lazarus' resurrection is he's going to die again. But Jesus says the resurrection that I will give to you at the last day will be everlasting and there will be no one that can take it away from you as I am raised from the dead and made perfect in my humanity. So you, 
if you believe in me, will never die. That is the second death where unbelievers are raised and given a body so that they might be damned both body and soul in hell forever. The believer in the Lord Jesus will never experience that second and complete and full death. And so with these words in mind, how should these words change our attitudes, our lives? How should they mold our pastoral ministry? My first question by way of application would be to ask you the question that the Lord Jesus asks Martha. And everyone who lives and believes in me shall never die. Do you believe this? Even in a place like this where we know one another, we can never know the heart of someone else. And so it's important to preach the gospel in every opportunity. And I would say to you here today, do you know the Lord Jesus savingly? And is he your Lord and Savior? There's actually some examples from church history of people who come to seminary who pretend to be ministers but truly are not. Elias Keach, the son of the famous Baptist minister Benjamin Keach, uh, was a disreputed young man who thought that he could come to the New World and fake being a minister. And so he came over with ministerial garb, pretended to be a minister, and on his first sermon he got halfway through it and then stopped in silence and began sobbing and the people said what's wrong with you well he was actually converted under his own sermon as he came under the conviction of sin we've even seen here and elsewhere seminary students undergo spiritual crises so i would ask you today do you believe in the lord jesus is this true of you there is no better place to embrace the lord jesus than here at a seminary but for those of us who do know the Lord Jesus already, my question to you would be, is death and the teaching of Jesus regarding death one of the motivations you have for pastoral ministry? If you get a hold of the reality of death and you get a hold of what Jesus says here about death, it should radically shape the way you do pastoral ministry because you'll have a sense that your time is short, the time of your people is short, and you only have a limited amount of time to minister the gospel to them and to help them prepare for death. At the last day, we all will stand before God, and if we're given the privilege of being ministers of the gospel, I think we shall have to give a higher account there are ways in which we know we won't use our time perfectly, but for goodness sake, don't let your account to Jesus be, well, I preached a couple of sermons, I read some old texts of theology, I corrected a bunch of people's theology on Facebook, but I didn't do much more than that. Be a soul winner for the Lord Jesus. Be someone who pastorally ministers to your people. Be somebody who is a dying man preaching to dying men about a living Savior and life that can be found in Him. If you get a hold of the words of Jesus here, it will motivate you to go out into your community and lead your people in evangelism. I'm not a huge fan of American fundamentalism in many ways, but I think the, the Bob Jones family had a wonderful saying, the most sobering reality today is that people are dying and going to hell today. If you have a sense of the shortness and brevity of life and the need to proclaim the message of Jesus, it should catapult us into evangelism. If you have a sense that every pastoral visit you have with people could be the last one because you don't know when the Lord will take them home, it will motivate you to be in their homes and to disciple them more and to pray with them and to help them. If you have a sense that every time you have to preach could be your last, it will give you fervor and zeal to proclaim Jesus Christ as the resurrection from the dead, and it will make you a powerful minister, holy, and therefore uh, a, a holy weapon in the hands of God for the advancement of his kingdom. And finally, if you get a hold of the words of Jesus for your own soul and for those who you minister to, it will change the way you look at death. It will remove the fear of death that we so often have and paradoxically will turn death into a tool of redemption that the Lord Jesus uses for our good. Death, as the old Puritan said, when you get a hold of the teaching on Jesus and the resurrection, makes death nothing more than a pathway that the soul must travel on its way to have more full communion with God. I think the Westminster Larger Catechism is probably one of the most underused tools of discipleship today. In the 85th question, it, asks the, the, it raises the question, why do believers still die if they have been justified? 
And it says believers are uh, delivered from the final day of death and they're delivered from the sting of death. But God still uses death out of love for his people to do two things, to remove us from this corrupted and fallen world and to bring us into more closer fellowship with him as we await the resurrection of the dead. If you have this view of death and you have this view of what the Lord Jesus says to us here, you will be able to go out and deal with people in their greatest fear in life, namely their own death, and help them see it as a tool in the hands of God. In closing, I think there are many beautiful illustrations of this truth, but one that I have never found any better than is drawn from the old book, God's Trombone. It's a collection of African-American preaching, and I will not do uh, rhetorical justice to this, but this is from the funeral sermon in that book, Go Down, Death, Go Down. A woman is dying, and uh, the preacher illustrates this from the standpoint of the throne room of God as God calls death into his throne room, and God says to death, Go down, death, go down. Go down to Savannah, Georgia, down in Yamacraw, and find me Sister Caroline. She's borne the burden and the heat of the day. She's labored long in my vineyard. She's tired. She's weary. Go down, death, and bring her to me. So death jumps on his horse and rides down to meet her, and we pick up in the, the room of the sick and dying woman. While we were watching round her bed, Sister Caroline turned her eyes and looked away. She saw what we couldn't see. She saw old death. She saw old death coming like a fallen star. But death didn't frighten Sister Caroline none. He looked to her like a welcomed friend. And she whispered to us, I'm going home. And then she smiled and closed her eyes. Death took her up in his arms like a baby. And she lay in his icy arms, but she didn't feel no chill. And death began to ride on up into the great white throne room. And there he laid Sister Caroline on the loving breast of Jesus. He took his own hand and wiped away her tears, smoothed the furrows of her brow and said to her, Take your rest. Take your rest. Brothers, we have the privilege of proclaiming a gospel that's so powerful that even death itself cannot uh, be upheld. It cannot even have sting for us. And so value this, treasure this for your own soul and go forward and proclaim that gospel as a dying man to dying men and help them prepare to meet the Lord Jesus at their day of death or the second coming which soever would come first. Amen. Let's pray. Father, bless us now. We thank you, Father, that in a world that is marked with sin and marked with death, you have committed unto us the gospel of the Lord Jesus. We pray that it would become more precious to us, that the Lord Jesus would be high and lifted up in our minds, and that we would be sensible of the fact that we have a limited time on earth and we should use that for the cause of Christ and to help other men be prepared to meet you, their God, their Redeemer, and their Savior. Bless us with these things, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thank you for watching this production of Greenville Presbyterian Theological Seminary. For more information, visit gpts.edu.